So, uh, do you remember the transfer property? Yeah. Yes. Right? So, property gap, did it satisfy the transfer principle? No. We clearly transferred until we satisfied, but not transfer. And why not? Because it doesn't take care of the inequality between the two. Right. So, it was sort of an average, right? But then which of the LTD class did satisfy transfer? Power distribution. Square power here, right? So now when you think about the MPI, the construction of MPI, it's very much, remember the formula, the breakdown of MPI is very much linked to the poverty gap measure, right? Poverty gap, you had poverty gap equal to headcount times income gap. The MPI is also, you have multiplication of headcount times the average intensity among the four. So the same logic that poverty gap is an average and does not satisfy transfer and thus is insensitive to inequality. Same thing applies with um, uh, adjusting the ratio in this in this case. But the problem is that we are in an ordinal world. If we had continuous data for each dimension, or cardinal data for each dimension, we could have computed gap and squared gap within the dimensions. That means we could move to M1 and then to M2 consider inequality. But in general, when you have ordinal data, we don't have such um, such such liberty, honestly. What we should do. Okay? So this is this is what we are going to talk or see in the next um, one hour or so. Main text, of course, um, chapter nine, we have the first part. Uh, sorry, it should be nine point one, it's not ten point one. We reshuffled some of the chapters in the end. Um, it should be nine point one. And uh, James and Sabina has this Mimeo. I'm not sure if it is available online. Their presentation may be not sure about the paper, which could be. And <laughs> then there's a paper by me and Sabina. Um, it's also available from the working, working paper. So it's mainly these three uh, readings for this, for this lecture. <coughs> so the main motivation, and we have already been through, um, Stephen Jenki, uh, Jenkins um, and Lambert, they call it uh, three eyes of poverty, incidence, intensity, and inequality. And of course, we don't have to talk about the motivation of why distribution concerns are important. We have already been through. Then, the idea is how to incorporate distributional issues in the measurement of multidimensional poverty. Now, you have seen some of these properties. James has also mentioned, but we have not gone in details. Okay, so we'll take some time uh, these next 15 minutes at least to try to see what we mean when we move from single dimension to multi-dimensional uh, world. How these properties evolve. So weak transfer. You remember weak transfer, right? So if you have an <coughs> average of averaging of achievements among the poor, that actually reduces poverty. So you have lower you have lower the inequality among the poor. It is an effect, it is a positive effect on poverty. Now, this is something that I have not talked earlier, but James spoke. Remember, James spoke about rearrangement. Okay? It is another way. In single dimensional world, you have only one dimension, right? Only one type of inequality, which is related to the averaging of achievements. When we, we are in multiple uh, dimensions, there's another aspect, which is the correlation or association between dimensions. Okay, it's the interrelation between dimensions. Right, we distinguish between, between multiply deprived versus non multiply So there are actually two different kind of notions of inequality in the multidimensional context. One that evolves directly from the single dimension, single dimensional context, where you have the averaging, it's related to the averaging of achievements. The other one is related to the association between dimensions. And in principle, in theory, okay, there are two different kind of sensitivity of poverty to this deprivation rearrangement. This is decrease in association between dimensions decreases poverty, and the other says that decrease in association between dimensions it actually should be it should be actually increasing. Sorry. So decrease in association between dimensions should increase poverty. I will uh, revise the slide and I put the uh, corrected slide. So please read it as increase, okay? So the concept is that 
dimensions could be substitute between each other or dimensions could be complement between each other. When you have a sort of complementary relationship, then in order to enjoy one achievement, you need more of the other. So one needs to complement the other. When you have substitute, you can substitute one dimension by the other, right? So in theory, if the dimensions are you have this substitution relationship, that means if you have better income but lower education, you can substitute your better income to get more education and so on. In this case, substitute. On the other hand, one may argue, in order to enjoy a better level of education, you need better health as well, because with more health, you can study. So in this case, dimensions could be complement. In practice, the relationship between dimensions, they are less well explored, and we do not know. At different level of development, we could have a different type of relationship between dimensions, and we do not know. In theory, however, when you have imprisoning association, that means poverty increases when you are substitute. On the contrary, if you have decrease in association, poverty decreases when things are substitute. The other way around, when they are complement. Okay. Now let me give you an example of what it means. Yeah. What do you mean by increase in association? That's how we tell you here. Let's try. Let's see. Let's give an example. <coughs> so first is uh, transformation for transfer. How the transfer works in the multidimensional context. So this is something, this particular matrix is called a bistochastic matrix. For a bistochastic matrix, the rows and these columns, they all sum to one. Okay? And you have non-negative element in, in each one. And suppose this is the achievement matrix. Okay? We have the persons here, person one, person two, person three. And we have dimension one, dimension two, and dimension three. Look what is happening here. If you multiply this row by usual matric, matric multiplication, multiplication, if you just multiply this row with this column, look what is happening. We are keeping this person's achievement intact, but we are averaging these two. Right? We know that this person is definitely, uh, this person, suppose this person is identified as, as non-poor, and suppose they are identified as poor. So what we are doing here, we are sort of averaging the achievements among the poor. And it should sort of have a positive effect on poverty. The next kind of things is rearrangement. What is rearrangement? Consider this matrix Y. Okay, this person is definitely non-poor, right? Compare with the deprivation cutoff, it's not poor in any dimension. However, these two persons may be identified because this person is deprived in two dimensions, this person is deprived in all dimensions. Look, what we are when we are moving from Y to X, we are switching. We are rearranging these two achievements, right? As a result, what is happening? Can you see the difference? So here, this person, this first person, actually has more in all, right? Which is not the case here. So if we move from here to here, we have increased the association between dimensions. If we move from here, to here, we have decreased the association between dimensions, right? So here, if you look at these uh, three dimensions, so this person has all, uh, if highest in all dimensions, here, second highest in all dimensions, third highest in all dimensions. So if you look at this association, they are perfectly positively associated, these dimensions, which is not the, across the population, which is not the case <coughs> in here. So association is higher here, lower here. So if you consider them substitute, you would say higher poverty exists in this matrix rather than this one. Clear the idea of association? <coughs> Should I explain again? Yes, okay. Good. No, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. Uh, so suppose we have this particular matrix Y, right? When do you say that two dimensions or two distributions, they are perfectly positively associated? When do you call them? They are 
think about the correlation as well, because it's a linear association, we are using a general Brownian association, right? When do we call two dimensions are perfectly positively associated? Right? So two judges rank these two distributions identically. <laughs> then you have perfect positive association. Is that clear? Here, if you look at here, in these two dimensions, they rank the same, right? This is the person with highest, second highest, third highest, highest, second highest, third highest. So you have perfect positive association. Here, it is not. Because here, the first person has higher, lower in first dimension, whereas higher in other dimensions. So if you compare these two distributions, association is higher in here than in here. So if you consider these dimensions to be substitute, if you assume that, make a strong assumption, then poverty should be higher here and should be lower here. I have a question okay. about this X, yeah, yeah. X matrix in the very last column and the last row. This is eight. Is it typo or not? Yeah. It's typo. Definitely typo. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for pointing the way. It's definitely typo. Yeah. Actually, this transformation will be verifying the association between uh, other indicators, other dimension. Association between uh, this type of transformation may be decreased uh, by association between other dimension. No. Other dimension by definition, it has to be you move from a non-vector dominance to a vector dominance. So when Bodhi and Chakravarti define this particular type of association, they only define in terms of two dimensions. So after the association increase in transfer, you must have a vector dominance. So at first, you have some people in hiring some and some people, some others hiring the other, right? When you make the transformation, by definition, I'm going to this is an example, I'm not going to the definition, but the definition, these two vectors, person one and person two, has to have vector dominance. So, so for person one has to be better in all dimensions at the same time. And that way, it can never <coughs> increase in between two dimensions, it's not going to reduce. No, not possible. Okay? Sorry, before. Uh, yeah. I need the map. What's actually the driving force behind all those changes? Be it for the transfer, be it for the realization in actual situations? Actual situations, suppose you consider uh, two different societies. In one society, the publicly provided services are very poor. You have to purchase everything, say, uh, by private. So, another society, suppose you have been public investment. In one society, those who have higher income cannot be purchased better health facilities, better education. So you will find the high correlation. In another society, suppose you have same marginal distribution, but you have good public investment. People good equality of opportunity. People only have to buy the high tax rate as possible that they are provided by public services, good public services. So you probably would have lower association between dimensions. You can think sort of this way. Uh, in, uh, well, uh, if the association increases uh, or, the, or the rank is uh, undisputed, I would believe when the dimensions are rather complementary, then the poverty should increase. Uh, Why? Because uh, if, suppose you said about health and education, which might be uh, thought of as a complementary dimensions, if uh, one person is able to enjoy both more health and education compared to another person, uh, and if inequality is also my concern, then probably I would consider that society as a more poor society uh, compared to a poorer society compared to another one where there is a swap between health and education, because it is complementary, probably I would say that inequality is less in, in that case. In the substitute, I think uh, the, the property should uh, decrease rather than increase. And that's my yeah, so the idea is a good point. The idea is that um, there are two issues here. When you are considering inequality, okay, so there are two components, efficiency and inequality here, okay? Even when you have complement, that means it 
is socially efficient, okay, for people like shoes, perfect compliment, right? It's socially efficient for people to actually have them all together because you anyway will be wasting something if you have drawing the other, right? So in that sense, although you are switching, the one person has more of everything, inequity is going up, right? It is not equal anymore, but probably that is socially efficient. Yeah. And if it's socially efficient, it's the betterment, that should reduce poverty. Okay? But on the other hand, you have, uh, you have uh, the case of substitutes. Well, if you have high poverty, that means here inequality is going up, definitely inequality. At the same time, it is not <coughs> socially efficient because this person is not trapped. Yeah. He does not have anything better yeah. to take him out of the poverty. Yeah. So that should have an adverse effect on poverty. Okay? Yes. Um, can you give an example of a bad stochastic matrix? Stochastic by stochastic matrix? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Example, what do you mean example? This is an example. Uh, not, I mean, like, uh, contextualize it. How, if I'm applying in the application sense. Right? Yeah. Playing in application sense. If yeah. I'm applying the application, I mean, if I'm applying, if I'm using a real life situation, what would be? Divide by the number of No, let, let me think. In real life situation, the main idea is that, um, suppose you have two different societies, right? We have similar level of poverty and similar level of intensity. We will come to uh, an example towards the end. We have similar level of inequality and similar level of intensity. Okay, but in one society, you have distributions that are highly unequal. You have marginally poor and the poor for the poor. In the other society, the achievements, they are similar to each other. So if you are ranking these two societies, and you want to be sensitive to inequality, you would rank the society, even with same MPI, same age, and same average intensity, you will rank that society lower because the distribution is highly undisturbed. So now, ideally then, one society can be obtained from the other society by multiplying. So the difference between two societies is that one society can be obtained from the other by multiplying by the vice versa. That's the general idea. Okay. Now, we were in cardinal world. We were in a dream world where we had all cardinal data, we had everything. But now what happens, and many measures, we discuss many measures in chapter three, I've probably heard about Gurdjie and chapter three, and, and there are plenty of measures that have been proposed in the multi-division context, okay? And it's hard that they, they are all useful for cardinal data. When you have ordinal data, many of these measures they become less useful. In that context, James and Sabina also worked on another property. This is called dimensional transfer. So the properties that I discussed just now, they were in cardinal world, when you have perfect data, cardinal data. But when you have ordinal data, you cannot look at the data in, in each dimension, right? It is not possible. You have either zero or one. Then, what they claim that poverty should fall whenever total deprivations among the poor in each dimension are unchanged, but all but are allocated according to an association decreasing rearrangement among the poor. Example. It captures the inequality in the joint distribution of deprivations. So this is what dimensional transfer is. So you have these two matrix, suppose G0Y, which is, you know what G0Y, G0 matrix, right? It's a deprivation matrix. So we have two deprivation matrices. What is the main difference between these two deprivation matrices? In what sense? That the second person is experiencing all the deprivations, whereas in the first one, they're divided between the first person. Right. So suppose you have equal weights. Here you can see the society has four deprivations. Both societies have four deprivations. This is very much linked to the example we had seen on the first or second day, right? We had two matrices where one person was deprived in one dimension, and there was another situation where everybody was deprived in the, uh, uh, sorry, that one person was deprived in all dimensions. It's the same example here, okay? Here, so what, so the dimensional transfer would be, you have switched 
this, as if you have transferred this dimension between yourself. So here, this person is actually more, they have highest, ex higher extents of deprivation than this person. So the same total deprivation found, one society is more unequal among the poor than the other society. So this is dimensional transfer. Great. Now let's take an example. Suppose we have a deprivation score vector. We have counted the number of deprivations and we have put them between zero and one. And suppose we say we equally, we equally weight them. We have suppose 10 indicators, okay, which gives this score. And suppose we say you are, I will identify you as four if you are deprived in 30 percent or more of uh, this damage deprivations, okay? Suppose we have these two timelines, timeline one and timeline two. So in timeline one, you can see clearly this person has become non-poor or has is still poor? Non -poor. Has become non-poor, right? Mm -hmm. Has crossed the poverty line mm -hmm. or poverty cutoff. This person situation improved. This two person situation improved as well. In this society, again, this person has become non-poor. This person's situation improved and their situation improved as well. What is the change in the multidimensional hit count ratio? Has it gone down? Has it gone up? Same across these two timelines, but compared to this one, has this thing gone down or gone up? Right? What about the intensity? Yeah. Excuse me, but usually when we are saying the in zero, we consider like we have if, if, if uh, anybody has the the k value is poor. Anybody has yeah, the the third person is not not poor, like usually like <coughs> k value is equal to then yeah. you are poor, right? So this person is poor. Ah it's poor. Yeah. Yes, that's why it's poor. No, I, I say like it's black, it's more black, so I was thinking about uh, they are they are they are poor and so you have obtained this obtained from this deprivation score vector, you have obtained in timeline one this and timeline two this. Okay? So when you move from here to here, incidence has gone down. Right? What about intensity? Intensity is same. Same across these two. And between this one and this one? Yeah, it has gone down. So intensity has also gone down. So in both of these situations, if there is the same reduction in incidence, same reduction in intensity. So same reduction in M0. Right? What about, do you see these two distributions to be equal? What is the main difference between these two distributions? Another way of thinking that in this distribution, poverty reduction has not been pro poorest. Right? Pro poorest in the sense here, the poorest person had larger reduction. <coughs> here, the poorest persons were left behind. The reduction actually took place between those who were closer to the distribution. And if you just use incidence and intensity, or a measure that only uh, captures incidence and intensity, you will just see similar reductions. You will not be able to capture this particular difference. Okay, so that is the motivation of this lecture, in this lecture. Great. So two practical properties are M0 that you have, you have uh, seen is ordinality, one because it allows these um, ordinal dimensions to be taken into account, and then dimensional breakdown, okay, which permits dimensional compositions of poverty to be seen. Now, there is an impossibility theorem. It says that there is no multidimensional counting poverty measure satisfying symmetry, dimensional breakdown, and dimensional transfer. So if your poverty measure wants to satisfy ordinality, which means that because of any monotonic transformation that you have on the dimensions and the poverty cutoff, or deprivation cutoff, there should not be any change in poverty. That's, that's sort of an ordinality property. 
So for ordinal measures, okay, uh, you cannot have any multidimensional poverty measure that actually can satisfy these two. The dimensional transfer is important. You saw why? Because it captures inequality. And you saw dimensional breakdown as well. And there is a deadlock. You cannot have a measure that satisfies these two properties at the same time. So you have to choose either one type of measure over the other. So either you have to choose a measure such as M0, which is we can have dimensional breakdown, but it's not sensitive to inequality, or you choose a measure that's sensitive to inequality, or you have to drop the idea of dimensional breakdown. So it's a normative choice. Which one you ever you think more important? Question how to proceed. Two possible way out. One is use a poverty measure that satisfies dimensional breakdown, and then use another poverty measure which satisfies dimensional transfer and ordinality, and just play with two different poverty measures. Of course, the concern is what, which, one, which one you want to put more weight. Again, a normative judgment. There could be a second way out where you could say, you know what, I'm going to use dimensional breakdown, but instead of confusing others with another <coughs> additional uh, poverty measure, I may want to probably capture inequality among the poor separately. And it's your choice. Whichever you feel is, is more important to you. So the first approach, it additionally uses a poverty measure that satisfies ordinary and transfer, and there has been various attempts to create such a poverty measure. So it goes beyond M0 in that sense. If you use this poverty, then you cannot do dimensional breakdown, but if you have to use M0 in addition to do dimensional breakdown, which poverty may you track? There could be practical limitations. This is mainly used for ordering to rank different countries, and most of the time the intuition is lost. You get a particular, for example, in M0, you get a value of 0.5, then you break it down and see. So it has an intuition. Sometimes any of these poverty measures will give you a value of 0.469, fine. But what, what does that mean? Is that number? Intuition is lost, mainly used for ordering. Uh, then it also does not pay too much attention in subgroup disparity in poverty. So in Indian context, we have seen that subgroup disparity has gone up in terms of multidimensional poverty measurement, uh, multidimensional MPI across, across geographical regions. In general, when you use this typical assimilative approach, you can say, or different approach, you can, you can say, for integrating inequality into poverty, they just use for ordering, and they do not go uh, in terms of all its practical applications. Okay, the second approach, conduct um, on an inequality analysis separately. There are examples where different people have tried to use different inequality measure to capture. For example, these. Uh, research had tried to use sort of a counting approach to measure poverty and then use standard deviation to understand the uh, sort of inequality in distribution among the poor. How this approach may be useful, it can provide additional information besides incidence and intensity can be used with poverty measures that respects ordinality um, and dimensional breakdown. And if you can decompose a particular inequality measure, you can also see the between group and within group inequality and so on. So in general, what you can do an easiest way of trying to understand inequality in the distribution, and you may want to present this kind of graphs in your in your presentation. You have computed, suppose you have used ways, deprivation cutoffs, and you have identified the poor, and you want to show the distribution, whether most people have similar kind of deprivation score or the deprivation score varies too much. You can present this kind of pictures. It shows uh, the proportion of people who are deprived in say 33 to 40 percent of uh, indicators, weighted <coughs> indicators, 40 to 50, and, and so on. This is one easy way to do. Now, if you have to do it for <coughs> 20 different regions, how you are going to do? It's a bit cumbersome. You can do it, but then page after page, you have to go through. Sometimes people prefer sort of a particular measure if we have. Once we have the measure, we check which one is more or less, and then probably we go and try to open up and then see the distributions. So in the second approach, uh, we may use a separate inequality measure to capture inequality among the poor. The question is which inequality measure? We have so many options. We have Gini, we have Atkinson, we have Wilson <coughs> variation, we have variance, and so many. Main divisions and so on. 
How is very different from value judgment? What kind of inequality you want to get? How do you want to get? So let's let's look at this, this thing. Let us consider an example. Suppose we have these two different deprivations for it. Okay. Here you have two persons with 40% uh, deprivation and two persons with 90%. Yet over time it has improved, suppose. And you have now the first two persons has only 10% deprivation. And suppose we use an immune approach here. Okay, so we identify everybody as four. And then two persons have 30% of deprivation. The question is has poverty gone down? If we move from here to here, how? What ensures that poverty has gone down? Intensity. Sorry? The intensity. Any property that you ensure? Monotonicity. Monotonicity. Okay, there's a property called dimensional monotonicity in this context, which ensures that poverty has gone down. So definitely according to any poverty measure that respects dimensional monotonicity, poverty would go down. Okay? Great. How has poverty gone down? Has incidence gone down? No. No change in it. Has intensity gone down? Yes. Okay, good, very good. What about inequality? Is the distribution of more unequal or less unequal? Looks more equal. Looks more equal? Depends how? It's an economic typical answer, right? Yeah. <laughs> how does it depend? Why why your answer is depends? It depends on how you measure it. It can give the difference. Louder, please, so that everybody can hear. No, it depends on how you measure it. If you're looking at the absolute difference between people or some other measure. Other measure? What would be other measure? If I look at relative difference. <coughs> yeah, relative. Look at the relative difference. But I would say if somebody is looking at the absolute difference between the values, the inequality has decreased, but if you look at the ratio, for instance, I mean, how much more deprived in terms of the ratio, the ratio has become three times. Probably. Okay, so now we have an answer that it depends, fine. Now in that dependent choice, which one do you support? Would you support the idea that uh, distribution has become less unequal? How does it feel if you go to a government and you, you actually show yeah. they have done a great job? And you are showing, you know what? The distribution is, is, I find it less unequal. It has been put, it has gone up. Do you think? Okay. I will just say the yeah. amount of the decrease. Sorry? So if I just look at the lens of amount of the decrease, yeah. then I can say that inequality has been decreased. But if I just look at the lens of uh, the status, the status quo, I think that like what inequality. What is the status? Like, if you compare just to 0 0.1 and 0 0.3, yeah. I can say that the 0 0.3 is a three times of 0 No, no, I know 1. that. I know that. That's so the concept of relativity. This is what we just discussed. So we have one concept. Yeah. We, If we view yeah. as the ratio, inequality has gone up. If we look at the distance, inequality has gone down. But which looks more appropriate to you? Which is more convincing to you? If you go and try to defend that inequality had definitely gone up, what would be your argument? Why should we look at relative inequality? I would say inequality has gone down because from 0 0.4 to 0 0.1, it has been decreased by 0 0.3, but from 0 0.9 to 0 0.3, it has been gone down by 0 0.6. So I would say the poorest guy actually decreased poverty way higher than the another like less So you should guy. have actually reduction in inequality? I would say in the way. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so we have different arguments from different parts of the world. Anyone who in favor of inequality has gone up? I mean, yes, of course. Yeah, I would say it's gone up because I would say you can devote the resources that has resulted in such a drastic decrease in poverty amongst the less poor to decrease it even more amongst the more poor. You are talking about an ideal situation. What could have happened? And but looking at this has yeah, happened. This, yeah, I'm mean saying it's increased, right? Because you are the saying the increased the because reduction is higher. For right, so your argument, yeah. exactly. So you, but a government which has done great effort, it's, it's, look, we are in a world where we are not looking at just um, just the amount of income. We are in a world, we are looking at different ministries probably working together and so on. It's it's hard to go and, con I understand completely the argument that you are giving. That's why I said, theoretically it can go both ways. 
but practically it could be really hard to go on the ground and saying actually no, you have not done a good job, it's a bad job, inequality has gone up. I'm not saying I would tell it to them. <laughs> no, 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 this is, what <laughs> this is what we already agreed here, that we have both relative and absolute. And if you see relative, if you say absolute, the question is what is the justification of looking at relative, what is the justification of looking at absolute? Look, and I completely take your point. In theory, it's possible. But that's a di difference between theory and coming in the, in the practical world. Anyway, so um, question inequality of what? It depends on value judgment. And that is what, that is what you all also, also mentioned. Now, inequality of what? Okay. If we look at inequality across deprivation scores among the poor, as you saw here, then inequality has gone up. And if you use re any relative inequality measure, suppose if you consider the relative, in any relative inequality <coughs> measure here, okay, in relative sense, it will show go up. This is a primary approach. I don't know if any of you have heard a paper by Nicole Rippin at some point of time. She sort of tried to propose an inequality sensitive measure. And this is how she tried to explain the inequality. And when I saw that, so she gave two examples. One example of a very poor state in, in India, Bihar, and sort of a much less poor state in Kerala. And she claimed that it's inequality of, in Kerala, for example, you cannot, you can, from that particular data set, you can hardly see any people who are deprived in 70% of more indicators. No. Okay? In Bihar, on the other hand, you have a wide, wide distortion. There is a large group of people who are forced of the poor. The claim was inequality among the poor was three times larger than that of inequality among the poor in Bihar. And I found it really hard to get that claim. In theory, you could do that with inequality measure, but I found it pretty difficult to get. Anyway, so this is, this is an example from there. Now also the question comes, is measuring inequality across the deprivation score is even right? Because when we do the analysis of inequality, we do in well-being states, right? Where more is better. And we say if a person who has hugely, you know, drastically more and others don't, then the inequality has gone up. Here, the example that I presented was a deprivation world where more is worse. So then people may ask, Anyone can ask you, well, this is, is it from the right way of even looking at inequality? Because inequality should be measured in, in a well-being space. Let's, let's go there as well. Let's visit that territory. Suppose we convert all these deprivation scores to something called attainment score. How do we do that? We just take the complement of the deprivation. So if somebody is deprived in six dimensions, just attainment this in four dimensions, if you have 10 dimensions, right? So we have converted everything by subtracting from 1. 1 minus 4 is 0.6, 1 minus 0.9 is 0.1, and so on. Now looking at this, what does it feel? Inequality has gone up or gone down? Gone down. This looks like a paradox. It looks definitely gone down. Isn't it? <laughs> Okay. Anyway, so let's now look at it. And it says, yes, indeed, inequality has gone down. So when we are looking at the deprivation score, probably it was not right. When you look at attainment score, okay, it looks like that inequality has gone down. So far, so good. Let's take another example. The question is, is this the right way to reflect inequality? Maybe yes. Now let us look at another example in attainment world. Okay, we have attainment of this one and attainment of this one. What has happened here? <laughs> right? <laughs> if you look at it in relative sense, inequality has gone down, right? Relative sense. One versus five and this is two versus nine. If you look at ratios, relative sense, it will tell you inequality has actually gone down. Again, so you see, the idea of relative inequality here, it's, it's sort of making us confused. Yeah? Do we usually ignore, totally ignore the, the distance from the Z, from the threshold? Distance from the yeah, Z? Yeah, because, for example, we only count how many deprivation you have. Yeah, we are using an union approach here. What? We are using an union approach here. 
Mm-hmm. In the counting world, reports, right? So you, what you are doing, you are just counting the number of pe- the people. Uh, sorry, the, the people. You are just counting the number of different nations. Okay. So what I'm asking is about if you are more deprived, like you have like a larger number of deprivation. No. In no. In the sense of of the distance from the. From the, the from the deprivation cut off or the poverty cut off? From the deprivation cut off. Ah, if you have less years of schooling or less income ah. or, or less health, yeah, yeah, so yeah. if the inequality among the poor increases or decreases in that, in that sense. The problem, this is what I discussed earlier. Okay, earlier the first examples, we had cardinal variables, right? So as long as you have all cardinal variables, you can do such analysis. That's not a problem. The problem occurs when you have purely ordinal variables or a mix of cardinal and ordinal variables, yeah. right? So when, suppose you have two categories, 0, 1, what is the average? 0. 0.5, but there is no category such as 0. 0.5. The multiplication to bistochastic matrix and all these things, they are just lost. So I am in a world of ordinal world. The, the particular poverty measure that you are using in your, in your own work now is the M0, where you are converting everything into 0, 1. And most of the variables are 0, 1. Okay? So in that world, how you are going to capture inequality? Through joint deprivation, through multiple deprivations. So even if we do have some cardinal uh, uh, others, we are ignoring them in this, uh, in this world. Why? Because, and this is, a, this is the problem I faced when I was working for Sabina and James long time in 2007 for the Mexico data. So what happened was they had some cardinal variables and some ordinal variables, mm-hmm. right? And we were creating, say, a measure, and then we're looking at their contributions and so on. So the problem happens is that you have, suppose, income dimensions and education. Income is more cardinal, it's continuous. Mm-hmm. Education is less cardinal in that sense. Mm-hmm. It is ordered. Yeah. And then you have a bunch of variables that are zero. So when you look at the gap and squared gap, so for income, you can get the gap. Lies between zero and one. For education, you get the gap between zero and one. What is the gap for sanitation when you have zero and one? It's one, right? So the gap is one. You square the gap, it remains one. You cube the gap, it remains one. But here, you have values between 0 and 1. You square something less than 1, yeah. it goes down. Yeah. Q goes further down. So when you create the poverty measure, finally, it gives you over a picture, but the contribution of this income and education dimension, they start going down, going down, going down. So however weight you put, it looks like the ordinal dimensions are the dominant dimensions. So you can face these different kind of problems. So when you have mix of cardinal and ordinal variables, it is not advisable to use sort of a measure assuming this ordinal variables has cardinal meaning conditions. And usually like when you are dealing with policy makers and uh, people who are doing the uh, uh, policy evaluation, etc., they don't come with the idea that, uh, okay, we did this, we applied this policy, we didn't really decrease poverty, but we, that many of the poorest closer to the line, they, they Look, main idea is poverty reduction. Okay. So you have your main tracking variable is MPI, not an equal to measure. Okay. But problem is, if you have reduced MPI, or you have not changed or whatever, but somehow you have not taken into account inequality. What, what we discussed earlier, that when you are doing using headcount ratio, you deliberately ignore the poorest. Mm-hmm. When you do, headcount, incidence, and intensity, you don't have any you know, overarching incentive to help the poor. But if you bring that into account, mm-hmm. okay, and we also present some, I'm not presenting here, but we had some examples that we had um, in, our, um, in our paper, okay? We can clearly see that for one country, we present an example of Haiti and India. And for Haiti, we find that inequality actually has gone down nationally, nationally within each region and also the regional disparity. India did not satisfy, did not fulfill that. Mm-hmm. Inequality did not fall necessarily. There was a marginal de- reduction in inequality among the poor, and within some states, inequality actually gone up. That's the idea. So 
inequality is not your main concern. Your main concern is to reduce poverty and taking those who are below the poverty line out of poverty. But why are you doing distributional issues? Because you also do not want the policymaker to just leave, you know, take those who are close to the poverty line out and leave those who are in in, in domestic relations. I have okay, two questions. Yeah. Ah, yeah, so about when you have such a case like older or variable, like the cardinal or variable, have you thought about like giving a less weight to the older or variable to just capture this scared case? So the idea is that when you have M0, you give different weight, you have M1 giving different weight, M2 okay. different weight, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because you are artificially reducing the importance of the dimensions because you are squaring them up yeah, yeah, or yeah, taking yeah. the gap, yeah. which is not the case for ordinary variable. It's tough. It's a tough decision. You will have different set of weights and makes your life help. Okay. But I just have a question about the weights. You know, we talked earlier about the arbitrary, potential arbitrary nature of assigning weights. And something we're talking about with ordinal kind of makes me think about order. Yeah. And this notion of rank ordering deprivation. So, like, say you have a really severe deprivation. Like, no matter what, this is always going to be the worst. Like, people dying from starvation. Mm -hmm potentially, and rather than waiting, you rank order based on the prevalence and then let the rank order determine the weight. So until starvation deaths goes to zero, right, the weight will continue to grow as that becomes less and less of a problem in society. Is this something that's been considered at all? Or, I, I mean, I'm just curious because it seems somewhat intuitive. So suppose you have three dimensions. Yeah. And you have three different kinds of severe starvation. No education, you have severe malnutrition, severe income poverty. Mm -hmm. Which one would you give more weight and how do your weight change? If you could tell me at least. The problem, I, mean, I know there is arbitrariness. The problem is that how you justify an alternative arbitrary measure, an alternative arbitrary weighting, right? Yeah. Because you, yeah. what you are coming out with, it has its own inherent arbitrariness as well. Yeah. Would you consider having a BMI of less than 17 more deprived, or BMI less, or no education as more deprived, or having no probably begging occupation as more deprived? I definitely would say this guy probably is more multiply deprived, so definitely need more attention. But that's hard. You must not compare it. Yes. You have thought of uh, squaring the, the A, that is the intensity, which would have taken care of the distribution. So we're in the A. A yeah. How come? A, you have two different distributions with same A. Squaring the A would give you the same A, same value. You know, uh, I'm saying if you are looking at the deprivations of the poor, yeah. and instead of taking the average of those deprivations, you get the square of the deprivation scores. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, then you lose dimensional breakdown. That was the main point. Mm -hmm. That was the main point. That is the impossibility theorem is all about. If you make an, a measure, poverty measure, sensitive to inequality, this is what inequality is. Exactly, ripping this paper. Well, I mean, emotionally, if uh, dimensional background actually is somewhat a perfectly substitutable kind of property, where a more deprived person can be substituted by more number of less deprived What do you mean by perfect substitutability? Are you coming from demand theory or are you coming from utility theory? Because these definitions are different. Well, I'm just saying. You are looking at this. Simple sum and from yes, the demand sum. theoretic yeah. approach where you have prices and all, you are claiming that they are perfect substitute. Yeah. That does not work in the mm -hmm. world where there's a paper, there's a separate paper, there's different separate concept in which goes to second differentiation of uh, utility function and define perfect substitute and perfect complement. It's different, I'm not going that detail. But you have to be a bit careful which definition of perfect substitute and perfect complement. Even for series utility function, you get different restrictions. Uh, on which uh, on your perfect substitute and perfect complement and even independent. So in utility world, that simple summation of deprivations will be considered as independence. Because if you take second order derivative of utility function, you get zero. Okay? So it, it's different. Okay. So how was G sorry? Please entertain my very silly question. Yeah, so what? G is oh, silly. <laughs> yeah, and then just that's what's G and how those numbers were computed. It's called generalized entropy of order to go to theta and ask theta to compute and compute. Ah, okay. <laughs> and if you want the formula, if you want the, the formula, there are several books, including the one that I told you that I have already given you the links. Just go there, it shows you simply how to compute it. Okay.
Okay? Generalized entropy is nothing but coefficient of variation squared divided by 2. And you know how to compute coefficient of variation? No. Coefficient of variation is standard deviation divided by the mean. Or standard of, standard of deviation squared divided by mean squared. Ah, no need to square. So you square, you get CV squared. So T2 is equal to variance divided by mean square. Wow, very good. And how? Easy. It's called generalized entropy. Generalized entropy 2 that I've used here, it is called, uh, it is computed as variance divided by mean square, then times 1 divided by 2. How? It's also the k measures, not inequality, which are related to the generalized yeah. entropy. Exactly. Okay. Um, so here also, so we require some value judgment. Okay. Because relative inequality measure is somehow confusing us in this in this particular world. Very confusing. Whether it's attainment score, whether it is uh, whether it is deprivation score, deprivation world. So uh, in the second approach, so we ask which inequality measure to use, which will depend on the value judgment. And one of the properties we want to want this measure to satisfy is the same level of inequality should be reflected whether across deprivation score, across attainment score. I do not want this particular problematic thing. What I want, you have the deprivation score, you have the deprivation matrix. Whether you compute deprivation score, whether you count the attainment score, I really don't care. I want the distribution to reflect the same level of inequality. Can anyone tell me intuitively how that is going to happen? So my no, I will I want to level get the same level of inequality. It doesn't matter whether I measure things in deprivation space or in attainment space. It's practical even to ask. It, it, I mean. Yeah, it's practical, I know. But what I'm asking, what, what intuitively do we want here? Do the distance change when you move from attainment to deprivation, right? So we are saying a measure that actually depends on the deprivation. It just normalized with me. So the absolute inequality measure, which depends on the distance. It's not the relative distance. Okay. We also want to capture, if we want to, between group inequality. It's not necessary, but sometimes you may want to say if the disparity in multidimensional poverty across region has gone up or gone down. It's also a valid concern, right? So in that case, you need to capture the between group inequality. I will show how, how, how we do it. And that requires additive decomposability. Okay, total inequality is presented as a within group component and a between group component. <laughs> then, going one step further, after I present this property, I will show you what kind of inequality measure this leads to. Then we also wanted to satisfy something called within group mean independence. Let's give me give you that example. This is very much analogous to something called path independence from the academic literature. Let me give you an example of what it is. Suppose you have these two different groups, okay? You have two different groups of pe poor uh, people or two different groups of poor population, and you decompose your overall inequality to the inequality within group C1, inequality within group C2, and then the between group inequality, inequality between these two groups. So suppose you have two groups, you are capturing inequality among the poor, suppose in this group, inequality among the poor in this group, and then you are looking at inequality between these two groups. This is how you break it down. <coughs> now, what I'm claiming is that, okay, suppose inequality, suppose the deprivation scores have changed somehow, but inequality in the first group has not changed, inequality in the second group has not changed. What has changed is suppose just between group inequality. Okay? So my claim is that this term should not be affected. Simple. If you have no change in this term, this term only change is between group, then that's the end. Okay? Of course, you must have unchanged population size from there. 
Okay, so this is the inequality measure we get with some technical properties, proving and whatever. There are different types of affinity measures, right? Okay. But if we want then to satisfy some of the properties, I didn't discuss some of the properties in the book. I'm not going to bore you. This is, do you know this particular functional form? Right? What is this? Is it? Standard division takes a square root. And if we do not take a square root, the variance. So this is a very simple measure, everybody knows. Beta is a normalization factor. Okay, you can normalize, you take the normalization factor, you can adjust its value so that the lower limit <coughs> even lies between 0 and 1. So it is called a positive multiple of variance of the distribution. Okay, so beta tilde has to be positive. So this is, has been a paper, there was a paper by Shoko Chakraborty who has, who has proved this particular theorem, but of course he doesn't discuss the between the mean, um, you know, uh, sort of the independence property that I just mentioned. And what you can do, then it's variance. Don't be scared with the formula. It it's looks scary at this point. Okay? It's simple. So you have, you give here the population share, if you are doing the entire population, or the share of the poor, if you're just understanding among the poor. This is inequality in the distribution within each group. And this is the between group part. So mu stands for the mean of the distribution, the average of the distribution. Ah, uh, they are lost. They always lose my notation. I don't remember. I will say to the video. L. It's probably the L that was, this particular L probably that was missing here. Yeah, this particular L. Okay. So two applications. You could look, you can focus only on the inequality among the poor. Forget about the rest of the population. If you do that, then you get this particular term, IQ is presented as this. A, you see, A is here, <coughs> what is A? The average of the deprivation score, right? So if you want to capture the inequality in the distribution among the poor, you just take their deprivation score, you compute the average, right? Subtract them, square them up, done. Simple. So this is inequality across population subgroup, and if you want to do inequality um, across population subgroups, Okay, suppose you want to do inequality across M0, okay, subnational disparity or disparity across subgroups, then you use this particular formula, which is a between group component, okay, this entire thing comes from here, here, you just use this between group component here, if you do that, you get this particular formula. So it is actually inequality across or disparity, subnational disparity or subgroup disparity across M0. So if you want to, in your work, you have 19 different regions or 20 different regions. If you want to capture subnational disparity, this is how you do it. Cross section, unless you have two or three different countries, I'll present some examples. Unless you have two or three different countries, they're not so much useful. But if you want to track changes over time, you can of course compute the inequality and see how inequality has changed over time. So, uh, Go back. M0 is, the, is our M0, right? Of course your M0. <laughs> yes. So then you own it now. Something that we recognize. But what is the X? I, I X is the matrix. So here XL, that means suppose you have three regions. Okay? So L is L can take either one, two, or three. So XL is the achievement matrix of that subgroup. So it's M0 XL is the is a uh, you know, M0 of that subgroup. And this is the overall M0. So you look at their distance, square them up, there you go. And also, you know, I mean, very, the deprivation scores are bounded, unlike income. The other idea of relative inequality is that income doesn't have an upper bound. It can go anywhere. <coughs> Here, it is bounded. This is not a problem as well. And with me, it takes three values for 0, 1, and 2. <coughs> Zero and one and L is the number of groups. If you have states, you have 19 regions, then L is equal to 19. If you have five ethnic groups, then L equal to five, and so on. 
Now, of course, this valid question, as I keep on, keep on telling, that in poverty measurement it is generally ignored. In poverty measurement, what people do, people just compute the poverty measure, and with some visual descriptions, you know, if you have three or four subgroups, they say, ah, this variety has gone up or gone down. When you have 30, 40 groups, it's hard to clear that. Even if you are very expert in looking at numbers, it's really hard to clear that. Why not try to get a simple number and try to summarize our, our findings? Yeah, sorry. Can we go back to one or two slides? One the or two. The inequality formula for the specific population subgroups. Yeah. I think the challenge there is how to compute the beta, right? That was just the... No, 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 beta, beta, beta is beta. Bet you just take the beta that gives you, uh, that allows you to bound the inequality measure between zero and one. So, okay. given a particular distribution, mm -hmm. it is always possible to compute the maximum possible variance. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So let's compute beta and tilde is then going to be the maximum possible variance. One divided by one divided by the maximum possible variance. So if you do that, it lies between zero and one. So beta tilde is just a normalizing factor here. Okay, okay it's a it's a parameter. You can choose the value according to your convenience. Mm -hmm. If you want the measure to lie between zero and hundred, just like Gini, you choose the maximum beta and then one divided by the maximum variance times hundred. That would be your beta. Okay. Uh, so if I remember correctly, I think like I can be actually tails measure or like Atkinson's inequality. If you want to actually this as, as establish this uh, the decomposition, uh, de decomposition relative really inequality world. Relative inequality world. Okay. Not in the absolute inequality world. Relative inequality world. Okay. Atkinson, for example, is not decomposable. Gini is decomposable, but with a residual, yeah, right. which does not have good meaning. Okay. Generalized yeah. entropy is the only class yeah, which right. is decomposable. <coughs> but then within generalized entropy, the total group, you have this total within group, right? Which is the weighted average. Yeah. So for a second measure, mm -hmm. these weights are just the population share. Yeah. So they sum up to weight, sum up to one. Yeah. But for the rest of the inequality measure, it does not. Okay. Makes somewhat unintuitive in that sense. Okay, but both variance and the absolute world is equivalent to that tail to measure in reality world. Okay. Okay. So disparity. Well, disparity is important. You want to know what is the regional disparity across M zeros, and this is what you can do. And it also links to the idea of horizontal inequality. You know, across across different population subgroups, across uh, different subnational regions, and, and so on. So here is a very simple example. I was supposed to present <coughs> this MPI bigger picture. I don't have them. I, I forgot to put them out. Not You remember when people are presenting about uh, about MPI and they just looked for me whether I'd be presenting uh, you know inequality and then I'm sorry I forgot to put the slides this morning. Okay, they are on the website, but you get the basic idea. And then you can always go and, and sort of uh, look at that. They're available from the website. Sorry about it. Okay, here's the example, simple example from the book. So we compare a pair, two pairs of countries, actually, Yemen, Yemen and India. <coughs> and so if you look at this particular example, Yemen and India, same MPI, okay? You have, okay, fine, different level of H and A, but not too different. Okay, I don't even know if they're statistically significantly different or not. But then you look at the inequality. Yes, Yemen in Yemen inequality is quite high. Okay, and they are statistically significantly different. Look at between group disparities, <coughs> they are also similar. Okay, and this is the number of regions, 21 versus 29. So definitely inequality is quite high in Yemen. Yemen you will find a big number of people, I don't know whether they are foreigners or so, okay, it is possible, because a lot of people come to work from other countries in Yemen. It's a big difference, when, uh, even within the poor, forget about between poor and rich, even we focus among the poor, there's a big difference. To some people who are really severely deprived, which raises um, this particular, particular number. Then, next is the example of Bangladesh and Togo. Similar number of regions, Similar level of MPI, age, A, inequality among the poor even, subnational disparity. Massive. 
in Togo compared to Bangladesh. So you get these numbers. So suppose you have, you were analyzing 10 or 15 countries, all regions, 10 or 15 regions. So you go inside them, compute the measure. If you see there is a large difference, go and open up the Pandora box and see what is going on inside. You look at, you can draw the pie charts or look at different kind of things, that Lord draw the histograms, and that will show you what is there inside. Okay, so, by the way, beta, for example, I chose here four. Okay, because if your value lies between zero and one, I think the maximum variance is something like the upper bound minus lower bound whole square divided by four the maximum possible variance in a given distribution in a given bound. So if you have a bound of 0 and 1, then your maximum possible variance is 1 minus 0 whole square divided by 4, which is 0 0.25. So what I have done, 1 divided by beta tilde, 1 divided by 0 0.25 is 4. If I multiply the entire thing by 4, it, it, it you know bounds my inequality measure between 0 and 1. That's the idea. What's its interpretation? Ah, that's tough. When you go to inequality world, what is the interpretation of G? Mm -hmm. That's tough. Just for ranking, I don't know. Yeah. Of course, it's looking at inequality. It's gone up or gone down. It's some sort of index to check your health. You do not exactly know. Well, your BMI is 22.5 versus 18.5. Mm -hmm. What is good? I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's tough. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <coughs> it's, it's difficult to explain. You just get this number. It is mainly for ranking. That is what... Uh, the inequality sensitive poverty measures do, that is what the inequality measures do. It is really, even for tail, even for, uh, uh, you know, uh, Atkinson's and all, it's difficult to find out the meaning of that particular number. You can express in terms of percentage, welfare, loss, and so on, but still, that then is a number. Okay, so concluding remarks. Um, <laughs> We looked at integrated approaches or assimilated approaches, however we call it's trying to you know, integrate inequality into the poverty measurement. The main problem is that in counting world, you can have sort of a impossibility result and also you could, there are strong policy implications, okay? Uh, and as you saw, dimensional breakdown and dimensional transfer, they just conflict each other. One can remain, both cannot remain. They cannot just go together. Either you have to choose one of them, those. So, either if you think the distribution of properties are important, forget about dimensional breakdown. But if, if for policy purposes you think dimensional breakdown is important, you cannot ignore it. What is the way out? This is an alternative approach. I'm not saying forget about the inequality sensitive poverty measure because many people may argue, okay, who are not related to policy, close to policy so much, that distribution properties are more important. It's a normative judgment. If you have normative judgment, choose an inequality sensitive poverty measure. If not, this is an alternative way to process. And the added advantage, of course, you can add a particular inequality measure that reflects the same level of inequality, whether deprivation, uh, whether you are in a deprivation world or in a sort of you know achievement world. Uh, and you can also try to tool, use this tool to monitor disparity uh, in poverty support. So, so this is the idea. So this is an alternative approach that you may take. It's not necessarily this is the approach you have to take, but it's you know given these different kind of uh, peculiarities, conflicts between, between different properties, that is one way of proceeding, one way of trying to understand the distribution of issues. Okay. I will stop here. I'm not presenting further graphs and all these things. It's also taking quite a lot of time. So I just break early. If you have any question, please ask me. We can also talk um, during the break. And then you can also do a little bit of work that, that you are already doing. We have some time. And then Paula will begin in 15 minutes.